Week two of the college football season is officially in the books. It was just like last week, except laced with roids. We had upsets, blowouts, and the exposure of several fraudulent teams who thankfully we know are not back. We're covering more games this week than the last, so no point in introductions. If you're watching this video, you know what you're in for. Welcome to the very short Friday night slate, featuring a primetime matchup of Methodists versus Mormons. Gerald J. Ford Stadium holds up to 32,000 fans and approximately 32 showed up. BYU coming into this game as a double-digit underdog seemed like a steal for betting odds. Seems to be the case as SMU went straight back to how they played against Nevada. Now, if you're one of these people who dedicates football to Saturdays and doesn't care what happens on Fridays, good. Keep it that way. This game took the game of football back to 1950. B.C. The offenses figured out how to get down to the red zone, but once they did, they ate a pound full of liquid chocolate, and I'm not talking about Hershey's. Jake Raslaff and Kevin Jennings were playing a game of who could piss themselves faster. The field goal kickers contributed more to the offense than anyone else on the team. RJ Maryland, who I talked about in Week 0 as a carrier of SMU, went like Danny Phantom and went ghost. BYU's defense had a great day with 3 sacks and 8 TFLs, an extremely impressive feat for defensive coordinator Jay Hill, who had a heart attack two weeks prior to the game. As we know in the game of college football, despite how horrendous the games are, there is always a win. He loves this game so much. The BYU faithful that are here making noise. Jennings dancing, improvising, deep down, big man complete. And BYU's... Not much else to add to this other than a big win for Kawani Satake. As for the winner, I have a job for you. Look up SMU and find out which conference they're in right now. I can't say anything about it according to at oh my Nestor, I'm just a hater of a certain conference. But I'll leave that up to your jurisdiction. Hey, you remember the game we just watched? You remember the feeling of agony having to watch four hours of incompetence by everyone except the kicker? Try watching that again, except add said incompetence to the kickers as well. Welcome to Football Diarrhea After Dark. As I said earlier, you'd be better off skipping Friday football. This game was so horrendous I almost had to switch to tennis. Awfully fitting this game isn't even being played in a real football stadium, but rather a placeholder lacrosse stadium. This was such a nightmare to the game of football, I was actually watching a Microsoft video tutorial from 1989 with the sub name, the most boring video ever made. And I was more entertained! At least he was doing something! How can you fix this? How can you make this game watchable? Oh, the little cute little buddy rabbit. No, hey, hey, leave that rabbit alone. He's by far the most quality entertainment here. Well, crap, at least that entertainment will inspire the offenses to wake up. Oh, boy. Oh, ball's out. Ball's out. Kamalafe lost the football. No, nope, right back to reality we are. With the help of the bunny, at least we got to see a perfect encapsulation of what this game has become. To speed things up, I'll use the same logic as I did for the last game. Despite how terrible this game is, somebody has to win. And the tie for Duke. Late into the game in Evanston. And Polino did not hit it. Thank you. Now it can finally go to bed. It's third down. It's Murphy. Back to throw. And has it. Completes to Harvey. Oh, no. No, 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 no! Oh, my God. oh, so now the quarterbacks choose to play like elite talents. I guess by warm-ups, they meant the entirety of regulation. But on the bright side, it'll all be over soon. Right. Nice time. Right. Retreating right for the Well, this is phenomenal news. Not only did Manny Diaz just win a game for Duke, but the ACC actually won a non-conference game. Unbelievable! What do you think about that, at oh my Nestor? Still a hater? All right, maybe I am. Maybe now Northwestern should go ahead and invest some money into those stadium renovations. I'm just glad this game is over. Wait a minute. Rewind that. We play the lead pin and pull type of scenario. Protect the Rockham Porter. Third and short. Okay, I take it back. This is the greatest game of all time. Game day in Ann Arbor, where the defending national champions hope to maintain a 16-game winning streak. Michigan is a home underdog to a team from another conference for the first time in at least 25 years, so you know they'll have a stance to defend. 
The only stance they actually succeeded in defending was the one which says Connor Stallions was the link to the 2023 season. What the hell happened here? I'll tell you what happened. Quinn Ewers. This dude came into the big house and single-handedly lit it on fire, with 246 yards passing and three touchdowns. Michigan was begrudgingly still having quarterback mismanagement issues, so you bet Davis Warren came back in to embarrass himself. He was like Matthew McConaughey in the Lincoln commercials. You had no idea what the f*** he was doing. He really didn't have a bad day with over 200 yards passing the ball, but two interceptions was the deal breaker. On top of that, remember when last week I told you that Michigan's lack of run game is a problem? Yeah, I bet they ran a whole lot better against the Texas defense. The game got so bad that Texas equipped a turnover item that actually worked. The more I watched Michigan, the more I'm convinced that they are in for a 2020 LSU level natty hangover. Look, they're doing the horns up! Maybe next time you should try stopping Texas on third down or something. Might be a good idea. Despite how much this hurts, I know that nothing would hurt more than the 2023 Natty being vacated since you sold your soul to get it. Michigan isn't out of playoff contention yet, but with Ohio State down the line, something needs to change. But then again, maybe Ohio State is the one who's cursed since Quinn Ewers couldn't beat Michigan at Ohio State. Who knows? You've got to be freaking kidding me. Penn State folding this hard already, and they aren't playing Ohio State or Michigan? James Franklin, what the hell are you doing? Maybe that hex that's on Michigan is a Big Ten thing. Either that or Bowling Green is just a group of five minutes. Don't forget they beat Georgia Tech last year. This is especially funny since it's quoted that before the game, James Franklin said that not enough people were talking about the Penn State defense. You're right. We should all be talking about how wrong we were about it. Connor Basilak, Connor Basilak is shredding this defense. I don't care if he had two picks, he had 250 yards passing the ball. To make matters worse, Drew Allar isn't performing his best either. 12 of 20 isn't good enough when the team you're playing has nothing to lose. You ought to be thankful to have someone like Nick Singleton because that's all there is for this Penn State offense. Something tells me it won't be the last time he'll have to clutch up. Otherwise, Happy Valley will turn into depressed plateau. A lot of these results depend on the onside kick. Long puts it in play. It is recovered by the linebacker, Kobe King. Once again, Penn State fans can breathe a sigh of relief. You're undefeated and you get an extra week to rest. Use that bye week to teach Drew Allar how to pass over the line of scrimmage. Cincinnati versus an ACC opponent? This gag is already stalled out, so I'll let the game do the talking. Kiner in the backfield on third and long. Soresby off the back foot. Joe Royer! Wow, what a totally shocking and unexpected result against a team from the ACC. Brendan Soresby doing whatever he wants against Pitt, and at this point it's safe to ride out the ACC and competing for anything relevant ever. You can't even beat a team who joined the Power Five two years ago. Womp, womp, womp. What time is it? That's right, it's pig time. The Bobby P revolution lives forever. He drove the motorcycle straight into the throat of Oklahoma State. Taylor Green had a phenomenal day with 400 yards passing the ball and 60 more on the ground. A very impressive feat for an underrated quarterback on an underrated team. However, despite this, the Arkansas Razorbacks in their great first half performance forgot about their biggest enemy, the Arkansas Razorbacks. And they hand it off on a jet sweep and into the end zone. Usually this is where Arkansas would go down, but Taylor Green didn't get that insane passing stat by laying down and letting them get the win. He struck back. Unfortunately, it would seem to be in vain as Oklahoma State would kick a field goal with under a minute left. No timeouts in a dream. Green has to have a prayer. Green steps up and throws complete. Armstrong is loose inside the 30 and finally dropped inside the 30. And so the show must go on. Arkansas managed to hold on enough to get Oklahoma State into overtime. Does it pan out though? Nope. But luckily for them, there's an ally called the Win to service them. And he missed it. Wide to the right. Despite having this ally though, the Arkansas Razorbacks were met with their worst enemy once again. The Arkansas Razorbacks. They're gonna run it anyway. This has to be an agonizing one. This win was one that Sam Pittman desperately needed to keep his contract afloat. They had the blueprints to do it too, shutting down Ollie Gordon to only 49 yards all game. 
but mismanaged clock management and three fumbles was the eventual downfall for the Piggies. Like I said, the biggest enemy for Arkansas is themselves. As for the Cowboys, escaping the jaws of defeat like this may have awoken something in Alan Bowman and Mike Gundy. We'll see if Gundy can deliver a Big 12 title without that pesky Texas getting in the way. An unfortunate chokes by the Razorbacks though, and more than likely that's the only one we'll see today. Right? And he reaches the end zone! Well clearly the Piggies debacle awoke something in Eli Holston and Desmond Reed as well, as they are suddenly going off now. A minute left to go and pit with the ball? Can they break the ACC curse? Snap is high, hold is down, oh, kick out of the way! And for the first time today, Pittsburgh! has the lead against Cincinnati. You know, considering this was one of the worst teams in the conference last year, safe to say them being one of the ones to finally step up in said conference would come as a less shocking outcome. What a comeback win for Pat Narduzzi. You bet I'll be locked in for the match against West Virginia next week. I'm not sure how this keeps happening, but Kansas State needs to start being wary of the green wave for now on. They already lost to him once, and here they are trying to repeat history. If you look at the box score of this game, you'll think it's a mystery as to how Kansas State wasn't blown out, as Tulane had 500 yards of total offense on the Wildcat defense. As we know though, things like that are far from the whole story. Kansas State's red zone defense was the difference for them in this game, pretty much what saved their whole season from a traumatic downfall. As for Tulane's defense, they struggled to get any pressure on Avery Johnson, not being able to force a turnover or a single sack. Didn't help that ref ball was on a brand new level of incompetence today. This could also be a significant reason though. Blitz coming. Backpedaling. Losing the football is Mason, and it's scooped up. Jack Fabris to the house. Yeah, something like that. The only thing more incompetent than the ref ball today was the work by the cameraman right here. Nope, not trying to see anything important or anything. Keep doing what you're doing. Well, Here's the game on the line right here. Here comes the Kansas State Blitz. Mensa on his horse, flag down. He spins inside the five, flags everywhere. Well, as I said before, this was a ref ball shit show. They certainly weren't about to let up at the climax. Who cares? This controversial call won't have any impact on this next throw, I bet. Blitz off the edge. Mensa into the end zone. And it's intercepted. He tried to Crosser and you'll keep Brown, and it's picked off by VJ Payne. You know, the only thing I'm going to ask of the officials is if you're going to decide the game on a pass interference call, at least make it consistent. If anything, it looks like defensive pass interference. Get used to seeing this in college football. If I were a Tulane fan, I'd do like the Florida State fan and try and sue everyone. Oklahoma better be on their A game next week. Well, Georgia Tech, I hope you enjoyed that one week of being ranked. It seems like the old fairy dust has run out for the Yellow Jackets. As I said last week, while I did mention the improvement of Georgia Tech over the offseason, I feel like that was much more of an omen to how bad Florida State had nosedived. It's not like Georgia Tech had a complete meltdown necessarily, though, as Haynes King had a good day with over 300 total yards and three touchdowns. The problem? Kyle McCord made your defense look like Alex Grinch took over. 381 passing yards and four touchdowns through the air is no stat to scoff at. McCord was doing everything he wanted, and even said it so himself. Are we witnessing a revival of the Orange? Whatever the deal is, they look like a formidable force this season on the offensive side of the ball. Kyle McCord leaves the country in passing touchdowns and could keep it that way depending on what happens later on. Just don't get complacent. As Georgia Tech just displayed, you're in the ACC. Nobody can be happy. For Tech, keep your chin up. By this point, every other year, you'd already be talking about making the Birmingham Bowl, so baby steps. At least you don't have Jeff Collins anymore. And now it's time for everyone's favorite offensive clinic in week two, the Cyhawk game. In a game where Cade McNamara had 99 passing yards, this is still ironically one of Iowa's best offensive performances to date. Caleb Johnson had a great day with 187 yards on the ground, and Iowa was controlling the field on the defensive side of the ball, as compared to the Cyclones who struggled to run the ball efficiently all game. Just when you thought the Hawkeyes were going to clutch up in the game, they Iowa'd and went completely stiff on offense. Cade McNamara struggled to remember what a pass to his own receivers was like, so the game became what most fans were familiar with, a battle of who can get a three and out in record time. 
Iowa's last drive was an incredible, absolutely groundbreaking 3 and out. And thus they had to give the ball back to Iowa State with 34 seconds left. Let's see how they screw this one up. And probably the win. Conrarty, kick on the way. And he got it! Case in point. They do this to themselves every season. Nonetheless, a 54-yarder on the road is definitely no gimme. If he can get it that far. High, deep, big grouping there, and it's intercepted. And it's a final now. And just like that, Kinnick Stadium parts like the Red Sea. Give credit to Kirk Ferentz, being one of the oldest coaches in college football, he has experienced every imaginable way to lose a football game. Now you can add a walk-off 54-yard field goal to that list. I would ask if Kirk Ferentz is in trouble to keep his job, but we all know how the rest of the season is going to go for Iowa. They'll win nine games of scores like 12-9, to and then end up in the preseason poll next year just to lose another game like this one. As for Iowa State, this is a great win on the road, but this does add a little bit more convolution to the Big 12. Who's going to win it? Not sure, but the race for it will sure be the most entertaining one yet. This is the year. Peyton Thorne has improved so much under this new offense. He's focused. He's having fun. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a dark horse for the Heisman. <laughs> yeah, nothing says Heisman like throwing four picks and having a QBR of 28.9. With Cam Coleman at the helm, I was convinced Auburn was going to shock some people this year. The only thing they shocked was the ACC fans realizing they actually won an out-of-conference game. It wasn't even like Auburn was out-coached or out-executed. They were just completely out physical. Also, as it turns out, having an average quarterback is a whole lot better than having a bucket of piss. You got run out of your own stadium by a team who can't even hit a 24-yard field goal. Even Cam Coleman can't catch. This is a nightmare scenario for the barn. Georgia and Alabama might have more yards and interception returns than you had total. If there is any advice I can give you, it's to try something new. Pick some other quarterback out of the locker room. There has to be somebody better than this. The way you are playing right now, I'm betting that New Mexico State is salivating out of the mouth for a rematch. Look at how blue that sky looks. It's the only thing that was blue that wasn't a disgusting mess to look at. This proves how spoiled Kentucky fans were while Will Levis was in town. Because what they have now is a non-existent passing game. Brock Vandergriff was 3 of 10. 3 of 10! For 30 yards in one interception. The commentators are right. Maybe Vandergriff is realizing watching Carson Beck play wasn't so bad. Whatever I said about the old Dominion game seems to have rung a bell with Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks. They look like two different teams. A good quarterback who can make good reads? An offensive line that can block for more than a nanosecond? A defensive line that could potentially be top five in the conference? Whose team is this? While well, it took a game to do it, the South Carolina team looks far more refined than the previous. The greatest upgrade was on the line of scrimmage on both sides. This performance was so impressive that College Game Day didn't bother to wait until the 7.30 slate to let everyone know they are heading to Columbia for a matchup against LSU. And based on the way LSU looks, it's very possible the Cox could be ranked at some point. As for KFC, reality has set in for the Wildcat Nation. Barry and Brown had negative 11 yards all game, and both of the transfer quarterbacks looked terrible. It's a nightmare for Mark Stoops. But it's early in the season, so you have a week to probably get prepared for the SEC slate. Oh wait, you play Georgia. Yeah, I'd just skip to week four if I were you. Okay, I'll admit it. This one shocked me. Based on what I saw against Florida Atlantic, I was convinced Michigan State was going to get beat badly by this Maryland team. While well, Aiden Childs did have three interceptions, he made up for it with three touchdowns and 363 yards. Receiver Nick Marsh was unstoppable, making the Maryland defense look like they already went home. If it wasn't him doing it though, it was Jerron Glover or Montori Foster. Maryland wasn't far off though with Billy Edwards having 250 passing yards and Ty Felton torching the Michigan State defense. However, towards the end, with the lead, they got complacent and when the kicker could ice the game, he missed it. It was all Michigan State needed to climb back into the game. They were nearly able to get the ball back until the defender got a little too handsy, and that's what the Spartans needed to get into field goal range for a chance to seal it. Yarder. He nailed it. Ouch. Losing with having less turnovers than the opponent is a tough way to go out. 
But Maryland man, calm down. Mike Loxley said the season is not lost. He's right. You knew before the season you were a seven win team. As he always does, he'll find a way to win in a match he's not supposed to and lose one he's supposed to win by 17. It's the Maryland way. As for the trend we'll see with Jonathan Smith, we'll find out that answer soon. Just remember this, last week you almost lost to a group of five school. Imagine actually losing to one. Ooh, that would really suck. Why do I hear boss music? Can somebody please tell me why Notre Dame always ends up in the top five every year? Every year, ESPN gives you a list of championship contenders like Texas and Alabama, but for whatever reason, Notre Dame is always on that list. Notre Dame's a real contender this year. I know they sucked the last 30 years, but this year, this year is totally different. Yeah, nothing says championship contender like being in a dogfight against Northern Illinois. I'm really impressed. Really impressed. Riley Leonard clearly didn't fizzle into the offense like Notre Dame fans are hoping he would. With no touchdowns through the air and two interceptions, that's clearly the best quarterback stat I've read all day. NIU didn't blow me away with anything either, but they were mistake-proof with the exception of a single fumble. Top receiver Antario Brown had 100 yards receiving, and Ethan Hampton did a great job with ball control and didn't have too much to do since Notre Dame couldn't score worth a damn. Despite all that though, Notre Dame was lucky to escape with the W, as they very well could have lost. Right? 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 53, but this is just from 35 yards to give the Huskies the lead. Snap good, hold good, kick good, you how about them Irish? <laughs> Touchdown, Jesus! <laughs> you had the easiest path to the playoff of any Power 5 team in the country. Actually, I take it back, you're not Power 5 status. You paid Northern Illinois over a million dollars just for them to south bend you over and clap your cheeks. There is absolutely no excuse for this. I don't care how good Northern Illinois is, you tried convincing everyone you are a top five team this year. Everyone in the top 15 would beat you by 20. Your playoff run is done. I don't care what you do from now until November. I would say December, but remember, you're too cool to join a conference. You're an independent. Yeah, you're an independent clown of the week. Wear this medal with pride and dance with it for a week. See you next year when ESPN tries to tell us you're a top five team again. Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. <laughs> Y'all hear that? It's the sound of Alabama fans calling for Kalen DeBoer to be fired. Don't let that final score fool you. If you watched this game before the fourth quarter, you know how much trouble Alabama was actually in. Last year, you were thrown into a matchup against the Bulls on the road, where Nick Saban was making a statement by benching Jalen Milrow for Ty Simpson and Tyler Buckner, and proving to everyone he made the right choice at quarterback. This year, the Bulls come into Tuscaloosa and make a absolute mockery of Alabama. No quarterback switches to fall off on this time. This was a humiliating win. This was supposed to be a night where you were celebrating Nick Saban. This looked like a prayer for him to come back. Alabama doesn't have the same wide receiver superstars they did in years past. Sure, Ryan Williams looks really good, but he's a freshman and looks to be the only receiver on the team. This looked like one of the weakest lines of scrimmage I've seen from Alabama. South Florida had a day running the ball with 200 yards on the ground and three sacks on defense. What is going on? This must be that Alex Golish magic. Don't forget two years ago he put up 52 points on Alabama as the offensive coordinator of Tennessee. Sure, the talent gap eventually kicked in, but this performance was extremely alarming. The Gumps are traveling up to Madison this week, and I know Luke Fickle is fighting his own demons with his squad, but you bet they'll be jumping around for an opportunity to take down a top five team. And just wait until Georgia comes to town. Nate Frazier is liable to have 500 yards on the ground if this keeps up. At least Alabama wasn't kidding about the old ground and pound style of football they're playing with because they had 200 rushing yards. But good luck trying that against an SEC defensive line with that offensive line y'all got. Might be time to refer back to the Bill O'Brien offense.
Depending on which way you look at it, you could take one of two things from this game. Either Illinois has improved, or Kansas has regressed. Both could potentially be true, but I'm of the belief that Illinois has massively improved. Illinois feels like Iowa. If the offense takes a light jump forward, it's a massive improvement. They've had the defensive weapons to win the big ones, but they could never get a first down to save their life. Although it appears one man has completely changed that fate, Zachary Franklin. Franklin was a one-man wrecking crew at UTSA, so to see him performing well at the Power 5 level is far from a surprise to me. But now that Illinois has at least one offensive weapon that Luke Altmaier can throw to, Kansas being in huge trouble did not shock me. Kansas had a pretty good day running the ball with Devin Neal getting 100 yards rushing, but the issue was that Kansas couldn't throw the ball with a hoo-ha. If Kansas had no turnovers in this game, they potentially win this game comfortably. But of course, Kansas fans are only left with a reminder of how painful it is to be a Jayhawk. My advice for anyone playing Illinois this season would be that if you're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, make sure it's not a low-scoring defensive game, because they're built for that. My advice for Kansas? Basketball season's only two months away. Is mayonnaise an instrument? No, but you can use it to beat the will to live out of a certain wolf pack. I want you to imagine a world where Tennessee has an elite offense like in 2022, but unlike 2022, they have an elite defense to cooperate with it. Welcome to the current year. Now, if you watched last week's recap, you know that I hinted at how badly NC State needed to improve before matching up against the Volunteers. Now you see why. This is a disembowelment of NC State where the Volunteers left no ashes after their destruction. If Tennessee struggled to run, the pass would score. If Tennessee struggled to stop them defensively, a walk-on defensive back would score on a pick six. It wasn't like Tennessee was perfect either. Nico had multiple mistakes in the game, one of which being a pick six, but NC State just couldn't capitalize on it. Kevin Conception, who was the wild card for NC State's team, was left with 53 yards receiving, which was still more yards than the total amount of rushing yards NC State had. Grayson McCall had one of his worst performances yet. Shocking when you consider that NC State's offensive line struggled to keep Western Carolina at bay. The worst part? James Pierce Jr. had as many tackles as Nico did. Is NC State really this bad, to the point that Tennessee makes it look like they're having a rematch with Chattanooga bad? This really raises the possibility that this might be the best team that Josh Heupel has had. And whether or not that's the case, we'll find out when they travel to Norman in two weeks. SEC night games have been Heupel's kryptonite. NC State, I'm sure, will rebound because, well, you already know. You know what time it is. Yeah, it's time to be reintroduced to reality. Looks like that social media reality show you call a football program is slowly getting grinded into dust. Deion Sanders spent so much time propping up his sons that he forgot about every other position on the football team. The offensive line is like going through a wet sheet of paper, a complete and utter joke. It was like this last year too, but somehow it got even worse. I say somehow, but we all know the reason. As I said last week, Shador Sanders is and always has been a great quarterback, but he's not the only man on the field. Nebraska had to do the bare minimum to win this game. Colorado could not and would not run the ball as they had a total of, get this, 16 rushing yards. 16! Even when Nebraska was only rushing three defensive linemen, the O-line for the Buffaloes could only block them for about 0.1 nanoseconds before Shador was on the ground. But this is what happens when you hire a clout chaser instead of a head coach. The only thing that would have made this better is if it was broadcasted on CBS. I feel bad for Shador only because if he had an offensive line, he would be able to show how actually talented he is. But he's making it all the much harder to root for him. Leaving the locker room with two minutes left in the game, blaming the offensive line in the press conference after the game, and even if he is right, this is exactly how you alienate players from wanting to commit to the program. It really doesn't matter though because reason A, Dion can't recruit. Have you seen his classes? It's just like Florida State, a bunch of one-year rentals and mercenaries. Reason B is that once Shador Sanders goes on to the NFL, Dion won't be sticking around. It's clear from the way he talks to the media that that's the result that's coming. Unfortunately for the actual Colorado fans, the circus will continue until November where Colorado will be left out of a bowl. Then the search for a real football coach can begin. Not only have you turned your own team against you with the offseason shenanigans you've done, but you've done the same with every college football fan base in the country. 
You're all ego, no wins. All the attitude, smack talking, temper tantrums in the press. This is all the behavior of a child who steps on a rake and then blames the rake for the bruise. I for one hope that bruise sticks. Anyway, Nebraska looks like a complete team with Dylan Rayola at the helm now. We'll still need to see a little more from them to be a complete believer, but they've got what looks to be a decent offense now. Could this be the year Nebraska breaks the bowl game absence streak? They do have the longest one in the Power 5, so it has to break eventually. They play Illinois in two weeks, so you bet I'm ready to see a final score of 11-5. Well, look at this. Consider me impressed. After the destruction of Clemson that was last week, I was expecting another sluggish offensive showing against Appalachian State. But instead, Cade Klubnick went nuclear, going 24 of 26 with almost 400 yards and five touchdowns, and get this, no picks. Now, of course, Clemson still had three fumbles, as it isn't a Clemson game with at least a single turnover, but still, this was a dominating performance. Joey Aguilar did what he could, but the Clemson defense was suffocating. Appalachian State had two other quarterbacks come in late, only to throw a pick and then leave. Where has this been? I guess you just never know what's coming with Clemson football. One week they're blowing out a team by 40, and then the next week Dabo is on a call-in show yelling at another adult. Have a good rest week, Clemson. It's looking like we could see a familiar result in two weeks against NC State. You know, I feel really bad for both of these teams. This game time was sandwiched between many other primetime matchups, so a lot of people missed out on what was a hell of a game. This game was everything we wanted to see in the primetime games. Two offenses going at it until the very end that were nearly unstoppable. Wake Forest had a better time running the ball than Virginia, but what clearly made the difference was the fact that Virginia's defense consumed Hank Bachmeyer with six sacks in the game. Almost the entire defense had a sack to go around. Anthony Colandria had 350 passing yards and three touchdowns to correlate with the defense, but it seemed that Wake Forest was always a step ahead of the Cavaliers. But as we know, in the ACC, everyone suffers. Brosterhouse under center gets a push. Touchdown! ACC after dark, everyone. It never stops. With two minutes left, though, it might have been too much to leave on the clock as Wake would immediately start driving down the field. Sure, sure would be a shame, though, if something terribly unfortunate happened. From the plus 49, three timeouts to work with for Wake. Bachmeyer fires, got it complete, more and again, football came out! Green tried to pick it up, and it looks like Virginia's got it! And just like I said, you're in the ACC. Everyone has to suffer. It's always the bottom feeders that have the best games against each other. Thankfully, though, this conference will be full of those types of games. Uh, Zona? You all right? It's week two. You should have gotten these jitters out long ago. You're not in the Big Ten, so offense is not optional. Noah Fafita didn't necessarily have a bad day, with 173 yards passing, but his offensive line was doing him absolutely no favors. It was a mirror image of the previous game against New Mexico. This isn't a South Dakota State situation where you are playing a great FCS squad. The Lumberjacks finished 5-6 and six last year. The defense kept the rush at bay, but the offense being as lackluster as it was put Brett Brennan in a situation where he'd need to answer a few questions. The game was in control for a majority of it, but this performance raises some definite red flags ahead of the game on the road against Kansas State. The old Wildcat Bowl. Technically a Big 12 game, but also not. Strange. How are you still ranked in the top 10? Seriously, what have you done to merit that? Rode the struggle bus against a bad Idaho team and then followed that up with a game against another Idaho team in which you did the exact same thing. Most people considered the Idaho game to be a fluke due to how out of nowhere it was, but now fans are comparing you to another F word, fraud. Oregon definitely had a better quarterback performance, or at least I would hope so since Dylan Gabriel was up against Maddox Madsen, who I swore put on a blindfold later in the game. 17-40 is a horrendous quarterback stat. The great disadvantage that Oregon had was get this, the line of scrimmage. Oregon was getting circles run around them by Ashton Genty, who had 200 yards on the ground along with three touchdowns. A performance like that could get you into the Heisman conversation. Along with that, Boise State was perfect when it came to ball control, with no turnovers, as compared to Oregon who had three fumbles with two being recovered by the Broncos. 
Oregon maintained a lead for a majority of the game, which eventually led to them once again escaping the jaws of defeat. So with that out of the way, I now believe that Dan Lanning has some serious questions to answer. Seeing this two weeks in a row is very alarming. Next week, you're up against your state rivals from Corvallis. Your defense has to step up at some point, otherwise you'll be another F-word. Fuck. Who plays football at 3 in the morning? Mississippi State attempted to play football. You shouldn't be surprised, this was always going to be a losing matchup for them. The Cowbell College did a great job passing the ball, with Jeff Lebby at the helm, this was expected. Blake Shoppin had a great night with 268 yards passing, but a clear lack of running the ball was what did the Bulldogs in. 30 yards rushing is not going to cut it anywhere. You don't have the talent to completely cut running the ball out of the equation. I'm sure you figured that out against Arizona State. As Cam Skibbity, I mean, I mean Scadabo, had 250 yards rushing along with 35 through the air. He was also their leading receiver since Arizona State only threw for 69 yards. Nice. For Arizona State, they have become a potentially formidable force in the conference which nobody knows what's happening. If this run game stays consistent throughout, they could potentially make some noise. As for Mississippi State, since Vanderbilt decided to participate in football this season, you'll be battling against Florida for the weakest link in the SEC. September 21st can't come sooner. And there you have it. That's everything for week two. Here's the week three top 25 poll if you're interested in seeing it. As you can see, I've made a few big changes, especially in the top 10. We'll find out sooner or later if this winds up being the right take. But until then, I'll see you guys next week, and of course, power to Tardaria. What in fuck's name are you doing? Oh!